Hey, Hattiesburg, it's Toby Barker. Thank you for joining us for this briefing uh, tonight. We're sorry it's a few minutes late. Uh, we are, we've are we been working through, uh, reading through the governor's executive order from earlier this afternoon and determining what that means for Hattiesburg and how we are going to individually as a community move forward. Uh, we will go over some new test results today. Uh, we will uh, talk through uh, Governor Reeves' Executive Order 1477 and how that will apply in our community at least uh, to uh, non-essential retail. And of course, we'll have our regular act of courage. So today's number, again, when you see these, understand these are system-wide for our healthcare organizations. Forest General Hospital serves 19 counties, Merritt Health Wesley serves 18, and of course, Simri and Hattiesburg Clinic serve uh, multiple counties as well. But as a, as a group, system-wide, we've seen 4,462 total tests done among our healthcare organizations. 526 of those have been positive. Again, those are not just Forest General Lamar counties. Uh, 3,724 of those have been negative, and of course, we have 212 pending tests. Uh, the 212 continues a great trend for us. We're keeping that number down in terms of tests that are outstanding. Uh, just about two weeks ago, we had over 900 that were out. Uh, bringing that number down where it's kind of between the 175 and 250 mark allows us to save a lot of our personal protective equipment in, within our, in the inpatient setting, and it also allows us to get our outpatient uh, positive cases onto a some kind of a regimented treatment uh, that they can hopefully remain and avoid the hospital. Our overall goals and all that we do in this COVID-related crisis, first we're going to try to protect vulnerable populations. Those are people over the age of 60 and those are folks with underlying or chronic health conditions. Uh, our second goal is to prevent overrun of our health care system by slowing the spread. Uh, we do this so that uh, if and when you get sick, there is still sufficient capacity at our hospitals, uh, particularly if you require ICU treatment, uh, for you to get that. Um, because we are the hub city, both of our healthcare uh, hospitals serve a lot of counties, and we have to make sure that we are doing our part uh, to try and prevent overrun of the healthcare system so that care is there if and when we need it. Uh, right now, hospitalizations for the system-wide, this is both Merritt Health and Forest General, uh, we have 41 people in the hospital who are positive for COVID. Uh, that's an increase of four. Um, over the average over the last 14 days has been 31.78. We have one patient in the hospital who is um, under investigation because they have either symptoms of cough, fever, or trouble breathing. Uh, the, the challenging thing for us and the thing that's kind of uh, disheartening is that we are, uh, we're back up to that high point of 41. Uh, we got there a couple of days ago, then we kind of took a dip, but now we're back up at 41. That's the highest amount since this COVID-related crisis began uh, for hospitalizations. Uh, we, don't, we not only look at hospitalizations, we also look at ICU admissions. These are the most acute patients. Um, these require a certain type of equipment. They require personnel with a certain skill set. And, uh, and so these are kind of the, the, the most endangered folks. And so right now we have 13 people in the ICU between our two hospitals. That's an increase over three from yesterday, uh, and it's slightly above the average of the last 14 days, which has been 12.86. Uh, no patients in the IC right now that are under investigation. So uh, we look at total positive cases in our two counties, which make up the metro area, 174 in Forest County. That's an increase of 10 over yesterday. And Lamar County uh, is at 82. They saw a, a few increases as well. So total 256 right now in the metro area. If we look over the five-day average, uh, the five we use the five-day average because it's more of an indicator of what the trend is as opposed to uh, a one-day aberration or a spike or a weekend when not as many tests may uh, may come out. Uh, but kind of a challenge here too. Uh, we, we reached a peak on about the 14th. We had 20 new cases that day, but since then we've kind of been falling. Uh, however, uh, about Tuesday or Wednesday, we started to see kind of the, the new the, the number of positive new cases start to increase. Uh, Forest County had fallen below Lamar County, but again, with the last few days, they, they've seen continued increases. Uh, we see uh, an increase of 10 today, and so right now they're on top of Lamar County in terms of new positive cases. Uh, in terms of demographics, in Forest County, we have 40% of our positive cases are white, 48% are African American, 10% are other. Uh, in Lamar County, it's an even split, 44% white, 44% African American, 8% uh, other. And so now we think about where do we go from here? Uh, today, Governor Reeves issued an update, Executive Order 1477. This updated his shelter in place to what's called Safer at Home. He named it that because the emphasis and the need is for you to continue staying at home. Uh, most everything is the same. Barbershops, salons are still closed, outdoor recreation 
um, uh, places of amusement that were mentioned in previous executive orders are still closed. Schools and casinos still closed. The two things that are different. Uh, first of all, healthcare organizations are going to start opening up for elective procedures. This is so people can get the care they need before it gets worse. Uh, you will likely see them start with um, demographics and populations that are less at risk than, than others. Um, we, they're going to have to abide by Department of Health and CDC guidelines. Uh, our hope for our community is that both Merritt Health Wesley and Forest General and Hattiesburg Clinic and all of the ancillary clinics uh, are doing the same thing, that they stay consistent, that they are in lockstep on what they are going to allow to go forward and they have quality controls in place to make sure that they are not opening up Pandora's box where new infections can break out. But I, I do trust our healthcare organizations to, to take those steps and we're continuing those conversations in one of our healthcare subgroups. The other thing that we're that, that's going to be opened up with this executive order, um, Governor Reeves is allowing non-essential retail to open back up to 50% of store capacity. These are things like clothing stores, jewelry stores, bookstores. Uh, however, uh, we as a community, when we look at what pace we want to open up, we are not exactly comfortable with, with opening the door that wide open. And Governor Reeves has to take steps, has to issue policies that set kind of a baseline for the state. Uh, one thing that you also see in his executive order is a provision that allows municipalities to set more restrictive measures to contain and restrict the transmission of COVID-19. Uh, we have decided to, to take that and use that. Uh, we are actually going to defer when it comes to non-essential retail to an executive order that I issued back in March that already is scheduled to run through the end of April, which is next Thursday. Uh, what, we're, what we said in that executive order is that non-essential retail shall limit access to their stores to either curbside service, pickup sales, or buy appointment. Of course, they can deliver as well, but at no time shall there be more than 10 customers in the building at one time, and it has to be by appointment only. Of course, that expires April 30th. That's going to give us time to continue to work through our working groups, to uh, look at our local data, and then to make a good decision. Now, you may be asking yourself, why not open up non-essential retail? If, 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 you know, if the governor has done this for the entire state, why isn't Hattiesburg following suit? And, and for us, we looked at the, the White House's criteria for when you should start moving into phase one of your reopening. And, and there are certain criteria that deal with symptoms, cases, and hospitals. Again, this comes from the White House's own uh, coronavirus task force. And there, there are several boxes in here that we don't check yet as a community. Um, symptoms that, that you know, we, we may be there in terms of downward trajectory of influenza-like illnesses and downward trajectory of COVID-like syndromic cases. However, when we get to the actual cases, a downward trajectory of documented cases within a 14-day period, uh, we don't check that box yet. Uh, 14 days ago, we were on an increase. Then we hit kind of a point. We've come down, but then we started to go back up again a couple of days ago. So there's not enough consistent consistency in that downward trajectory for us to feel comfortable. And, and there's also, uh, on the second part, the or, is the downward trajectory of positive tests as a percent of total tests. In fact, uh, one of our healthcare organizations is actually seeing that percentage of positive tests, of total tests, go up in the last couple of days. So we don't check the box yet for cases. Um, and, 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 and another thing is we, we don't quite, um, when we're looking at these guidelines, we also don't meet the hospital threshold. We still have several um, several uh, patients who are in critical care, we, we, that number has gone up as far as total hospitalization. So in conclusion, we don't meet the mark yet. Um, we don't meet the White House's guidelines for moving into phase one of reopening, which is why we believe it's in our best interest of our community um, to, to limit that access. And so uh, this is the criteria that's publicly available online. I encourage you to go look at it. Um, this is the threshold. This is one of the factors that we will look at when we're determining at what pace we might open things up. Uh, we're looking at history, too. We, we know what happened uh, with the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. We, we don't want to see that happen knowing that it could happen. So as of Monday uh, at 8 a.m., uh, non-essential retail can open up for by appointment only. They can go in the stores no more than 10. Um, of course, they can do drive through pick up curbside, or delivery. Uh, all employees must wear masks. That's an executive order that we issued a couple of weeks ago. Um, our essential stores, for the most part, have done a great job with that. We believe that, that masks are going to be part of our future for the next uh, several weeks and months because that's a way for us to protect ourselves and each other. Uh, and you'll also see on Monday healthcare organizations starting to open up for certain elective procedures, and they'll continue to work through that as well. Uh, so the message tonight and through this weekend is stay the course. I know that in recent days and last weekend we saw more people out 
and, and I know people are getting restless. I know this is hard, um, but we need you to go about your daily life with the long game in mind. Um, this is requiring a certain perseverance and a certain um, uh, endurance from us when it comes to being patient, when it comes to uh, making sure that we're making good, responsible, individual and collective decisions. But understand that we, we do these things with the best interest of our city in mind. We do it with consulting um, with our medical community and looking at our own data. Uh, so on a positive note, we want to spotlight an act of courage that we do every time during this briefing. And today I want to spotlight a, a few special ladies who have taken the this whole idea of mask to a, an entirely new level. Uh, Kay Russell, who is not pictured here, uh, Kay Russell worked at Forest General for over 40 years, and she still has um, family members who do work in healthcare. And so when this issue of the scarcity of personal protective equipment came up, uh, Kay and her friends jumped to it. Of course, when a, when a surgeon or a doctor is seeing patients and, and nurses are seeing patients all day and they have an N95 or they have a surgical mask, uh, having a cloth mask around it can help protect it from getting soiled and it can buy it some extra lifetime. Uh, and so uh, Kay and her friends, Claire Curtis, and a lot of people that are mentioned below um, have gotten to uh, fabrics donated and every day they're cranking out new masks and have, have really mobilized a, a, peri a, a network of seamstresses and other people who, who like to do this. And so far they've given out 6,000 masks in our community, not only to medical community, but also um, to animal shelters and people who do lawn care and um, just any kind of professional that needs one, they've been there to provide them. And uh, these kind of acts, uh, people leading from the front, people taking ownership of their community, doing their part, um, doing the right thing, that's what's going to get us through this. That's, that's why we're going to get through this together. So thank you to them. Uh, and finally, as we go into the weekend, please remember, um, this is not just a list that we rattle off. This is our sincere um, request of you is to wash your hands, take care of yourself physically and mentally, wear a mask if you go out in public. It's very important. That's going to be part of our future if we want to see this economy open up and do only what is essential and stay home. If you have questions over the weekend, please reach out to us, particularly when it comes to guidance on the governor's executive order. Uh, but please take care of yourself, stay home, and we hope to talk to you soon. Courage.